Welcome back to Bible study. Uh, I could say welcome back to Jonah, but that wouldn't be quite accurate. It's welcome back to Bible study, and we're going to be studying the sequel to Jonah, which is the prophecy of Nahum. And I'm joined by John Campbell. Hello, everyone. John. And um, Derek Walker. Hello. Uh, it's been, you know, Jonah was, was a great privilege, and to be with you both, it was really wonderful. Now, um, Nahum is three chapters. We will see, as we always say at the beginning of a, a study, uh, we'll see how it pans out. Uh, we're going to read all, all three chapters uh, between us, and then we will drill in. We'll drill in. So, um, Derek, could you read chapter one? Chapter then John, one. chapter two, I'll read chapter three. The book of Nahum. The burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. God, the Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and he will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers, Bashan and Carmel wither, and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake before him, the hills melt, and all the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who trust in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make an utter end of its place and darkness will pursue his enemies. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. For while tangled like thorns and while drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble fully dried. From you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counsellor. Thus says the Lord, though they are safe and likewise many, yet in this manner they will be cut down when he passes through. Though I've afflicted you, I will afflict, afflict you no more. For now I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molten image. I will dig your grave, for you are vile. Behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feasts. Perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. He who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily. The Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel, for the emptiers have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. The shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his preparation, and the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk. They make haste to her walls and the defense is prepared. The gates of the rivers are opened and the palace is dissolved. It is decreed. She shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up and her maidservant shall lead her as with the voice of doves beating their breasts. Though Nineveh of old was like a pool of water, now they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry, but no one turns back. Take spoil of silver, take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every desirable prize. She's empty, desolate and waste. The heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is in every side and all their faces are drained of colour. Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions where the lion walked, the lioness and the lion cubs? And no one made them afraid. The lion tore in pieces enough for his cubs, killed for his lionesses. 
filled his caves with prey and his dens with flesh. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. Woe to the bloody city. It is full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots. Horsemen charge with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses because of the multitude of harlot trees of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries who sells nations through her harlot trees and families through her sorceries. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you a spectacle. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? Are you better than No Ammon that was situated by the river? that had the waters around her, whose rampart was the sea, whose wall was the sea. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was boundless. Put and Lubim were your helpers, yet she was carried away. She went into captivity. Her young also were dashed to pieces at the head of every street. They cast lots for her honourable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. You also will be drunk. You will be hidden. You also will seek refuge from the enemy. All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they are shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. Surely your people in your midst are women. The gates of your land are wide open for your enemies. Fire shall devour the bars of your gates. Draw your water for the siege. Fortify your strongholds. Go into the clay and tread the mortar. Make strong the brick kiln. There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will eat you up like a locust. Make yourself many like the locust. Make yourself many like the swarming locusts. You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. The locust plunders and flies away. Your commanders are like swarming locusts and your generals like great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges on a cold day. When the sun rises, they flee away and the place where they are is not known. Your shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria, your nobles rest in the dust, your people are scattered on the mountains and no one gathers them in. Your injury has no healing, your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you, for upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually. Would you like to pray? Thanks, Tony. Lord, we thank you for this, this precious book of Nahum. We thank you that it reveals much about you, Lord, and it is a comfort to us to know that you are a strong God, that you will, that you do not compromise with evil and that you will judge evil. And that, Lord, when you judge, you do it righteously. Lord, thank you for opening our eyes as we study this book, that we would know you better and, and rest our hope in you and our trust in you. Thank you for your word to us today. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you very much.
So, uh, Derek just mentioned it's your word for us today. Um, and John, we, uh, recently, amazingly, during this pandemic, we have a discovery of new fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we were talking about it just earlier. So, um, Derek will give us a sort of overview, a summary of, of these three chapters. <coughs> and I thought it'd be interesting for the viewers just to look at. Uh, it was only two or three verses that were found in the same location in Qumran, yeah. uh, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947. Yes. What were those verses, well, John? Can I just track back a bit? Of course. Can I just to set the scene for this, because um, Nahum means comfort. And you could read this book of Nahum and think, well, there's not much comfort in that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it, it's a judgment and it explains why they're judged and what's going to happen. And, and it, Derek will give us more on that in a minute. Um, but it's very much a book for our time. It was a, it's, it's both historical and prophetic. And, and, and in its historical concept, we can, we can understand how it was of some comfort to Israel. Israel is referred to in a few mm -hmm. verses, how the yoke is being broken off them. And this would be of a comfort to them. But for us, who live in the most extraordinary days, um, where the whole world seems to be falling apart behind us, and if you have no concept of biblical prophecy, you, you just be in a complete world about what is happening mm -hmm. and what life is going to be like. Mm -hmm. Well, having said that, um, and we'll look That's at That's a good background, my yeah. Very, very it, important. We'll be looking at that in more detail. Right on cue, on the 16th of March this year, two fragments, one of, um, of Nahum and one of Zechariah, were found in, the, in, in that cave which you have to, I forget, it was cave, cave of Doom or something it's called, isn't it? You have to scale down a cliff to get into it, uh, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. They were put in a safe place. I mean, there was no way they were going to be found by a passerby. And, and these two, um, these little scrolls arrived in the world. Just fragments of fragments. scrolls. Fragments, yeah. Little tiny. I think, you know, that they're sort of a centimetre by a centimetre. They're tiny, tiny, tiny were discovered. And uh, within the book of Nahum, it was uh, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. The mountains quake before him, the hills melt and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it, who can stand before his indignation and who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. Mm. That was found this mm. year mm. with a world that's in mm. chaos. It's interesting because you, you've mentioned comforter. Yes. Well, for those who believe in God, they have to go to Psalm, I think it's 76, where, or five, where it says, when the world quakes. Yes. Uh, and it's worth just looking at that. Um, I've, I've got my nearly infallible version here, and only because I know photographically <laughs> where, where it is on the page. And it says um, in verse two of Psalm 75, um, you say, I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge uprightly. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold the pillars firm. Yeah. Now, for a believer, that is greatly reassuring. Great, mm. because great, God, you know, the default position is chaos, man ruling, yes. trying to work out the solution to the pandemic, um, and it's not very reassuring. Yeah. That's the default position. But but God, by you know His miracle and creative power, can hold the whole thing together. Well, he can. He can hold the atoms together, he can hold the, the pillars of the earth together. together by the word and of that's his power. the comfort of Nahum. It's, it's huge, huge comfort. I will but, get but, to Derek in a yeah, minute, but, but we're on but, a roll. But we're on a let's roll. just refer back to a moment to these two fragments, because yeah. it is extraordinary when you put them side by side. So we, I've just read to you um, f verses five and six in chapter mm. one, which is one of the fragments that was yeah. found, where the Lord is talking about what he, who he is and what he will do and how he will do it. Yeah. He's talking about his absolute irrevocable power. Mm. Now put side by side with that announcement, yeah. Zechariah uh, chapter 8 verses um, 16 and 17, so which were other also found. passage found, yeah. Yes. And so we, we take what that it. says mm. and now we get the Lord again telling you how you can get out of it. This is, if you like, a bit like Jonah all over again. Repent and, and, and the judgment will so Let's come. just read those Zechariah verses. Zechariah verse 8. These things you shall do. 
Speak each man the truth to his neighbour. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice and peace. Let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbour and do not love a false oath. For all these things that I hate, says the Lord. So, so you can see how you, these fragments, it, the Lord is saying, I'm warning you, Today. this is how you get out of it. Yeah. And this was found this year, yeah. bang on time, yeah. while the world is sinking deeper and deeper. It's not just the pandemic. Yeah. It's everything else that's going on behind the Thank evil families much. that have been running the world and fleecing it for centuries. And this is exactly what Assyria was doing. Yeah. It's no different. This is a book for our Thank time. You. Thank it's you both much. the type and the antitype. Mm, wonderful, about. wonderful. So uh, that, was, that was Zechariah 8, verses 16, 17. And now we're going to return to Nahum. Um, Derek, we absolutely, we could, both John and I could just sit here and listen to you. So we're going to start now <laughs> um, and um, just have an overview of, of the three chapters. Yes, just the three chapters, um, you know, sometimes chapter divisions are done wrong, but I, I think Nahum is, is is not bad, it's pretty good. So we can kind of divide it nicely into three chapters. Um, one way of doing it would be chapter one, because it's, it's all about judgment on Nineveh, mm. and it's a prophecy that was fulfilled in detail. It's a tremendous example of fulfilled prophecy in the Bible, so we'll, we'll talk about that. But it's judgment or vengeance. You know, God says, vengeance is mine. Um, we're not to in, in, indulge in vengeance, but that, because that, that's God's job. Mm. And so we could call it about judgment or vengeance decreed. That's chapter one. That's in chapter one, you see the divine warrior. Mm. It's, it's God, you know, rising up into action and, uh, as, you know, enough already now. And he's going, moving in judgment. So in, in a sense, he decrees the judgment. And, and it's very much a vision of the divine judge, the divine warrior going to, to, to war against his enemies. And then chapter two is the judgment described. So that is, uh, and it says at the beginning that it was a vision. So Nahum received a lot of this book in vision form, mm. where he, he, in the portions of chapter two, it's, it's as if he's seeing it before his eyes. He's got this open vision. He's seeing the battle take place, you know, and that's, that's kind of a lot of chapter two is, is the judgment described. And then chapter three, we could say is vengeance vindicated. Um, or the judgment deserved. In other words, it, it's got explanations in chapter three as to why, you know, this is a righteous judgment. This is that they deserved it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, not just God says that, but like all the surrounding nations in the end say yes, about time too, yeah. kind of thing. So this was a, ju a righteous judgment. It was a vindicated judgment. Mm -hmm. So judgment decreed, chapter one, judgment described, chapter two, Judgment deserved, mm -hmm. chapter three, mm -hmm. and and but it's all centres around, obviously, um, in very poetic language, how uh, the the this promised judgment against Nineveh, which at the time of giving the prophecy would have been a shock, because you know, Nineveh was the superpower of its time, nobody thought thought it could possibly be destroyed. And yet it, it came to pass, of course, exactly. And it was literally at their height. We'll go We'll, into we'll talk detail. about that, but we'll yes, it was at the height of the Assyrian Empire. Yeah. And, and yet just a few years later, mm -hmm. um, it all came to pass. And, and the amazing thing is Nahum gives precise details as to how it happened. Mm -hmm. And it happened exactly that way. We know that from history. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is a very impressive prophecy, mm -hmm. you might say. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I mean, what, what strikes me is we, we've spent was it eight weeks studying um, Jonah and seeing God's mercy on the people of Nineveh, the repentance, the wonderful story. Mm. And yet within, I don't know how long, how many uh, years, 25 <laughs> years, um, it's all forgotten yeah. what God's done. Yeah. And, and then, you know, the consequences of forgetting God yeah. are quite severe, quite mm. severe. Um, right, I think it'd be good to try and, and just piece, uh, go through uh, piece by piece um, chapter one, if that's all right. And it starts with... Um, Would it be worth what, just... Yeah, um, what we forgive me. Yeah, no, no, not at all. Um, Would uh, it be worth just d looking getting at the, the kings, get, getting looking the, at the context? Just yep. getting the date right. Great, yeah. Because that will just definitely, help definitely. Just flesh that out. So we've said it was sort of a hundred and so years after the Jonah or 150? Yeah. I, I, I would place Jonah at about 830 BC. Okay. Um, 
and then let's say 100 years later. So yeah. they repent. Assyria goes very quiet around this time, mm -hmm. which, which, because it was a true repentance, they, their lust for power was kind of broken. Mm -hmm. and, they, and so the Assyria, you don't hear so much about the Assyrian Empire for a bit mm -hmm. until um, Mr. Tiglath Pileser arises. Oh, we've heard about him. Okay. Now, has and, everyone uh, been listening? Because otherwise, you've got to go back to the Jonah study to hear what was his name again. He's, he's in the Bible. Yeah, of course. Tiglath Pileser. Yeah, I know, I know. Because this is when Assyria now gets, in a sense, as repented of it, his, her repentance. Yeah. And now is embracing her, her gods like Ishtar. Yeah. The, the god of war, mm. and now she now wants to be expansionist again. And, and so Tiglath-Pileser is the first one that is known as the founder of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. This mm. is the, like Assyria rising again, mm. um, in some ways becoming the powerful empire, but also embracing the same cruelty, the same things that will ultimately and it, bring and about her judgment. during the Neo-Assyrian phase yeah. that you have Sennacherib. Yeah. So we're talking about that was when exactly. they really yeah. arrived. So there was... Interrupt, by the way, Hezekiah. John, at any no, moment. No, with Hezekiah on the throne in... Exactly. In, that's right. Exactly. And, and in a sense, I think we, we're going to say that this judgment coming on Nineveh is, is really a judgment on the whole Assyrian empire, from probably from Tiglath-Pileser onwards, mm. because this is when they repented of their repentance yeah. and turned away from God and his principles and turn back to the, the old thing. And Tiglath... And that's the point. So that they, the, um, the, the Jonah repentance is exceptional in, in their history, according to yes. their gods and their whole ethos. It was completely against the grain. That the people of Nineveh would turn to mm. uh, Jehovah. But we, but we, see, we see this pattern of uh, <clears throat> judgment pronounced, God in his grace giving a period of repentance, and then the final judgment. And it's, it's, it's what the whole of biblical history comes through, and it's what we're going through now. Mm. You know, the times, the, the world by and large has turned its, its back on God. I, having, I, having walked with the Lord a great chunk of it for a, for, for a couple of hundred years has now turned its back by and large, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, and we are in exactly these times, the parallel times. This is the type. We're now walking in the anti-type. Yeah. So without digressing too much, I. I do remember, and I mentioned it to you both earlier, when I was younger, having a blazing, fiery row <laughs> with a charismatic, you know, leader um, who, who was sort of, um, uh, sort of espousing extra-biblical themes. And, and, I, and I was pointing him back to God's word, and he said, ah, but um, the story of Nineveh shows that God can change his mind. <laughs> and therefore, you know, I have this direct, you know, by this lovely Holy Spirit charismatic renewal, I, I am getting direct, uh, direct feed from, from God, um, which supersedes the scripture. And I, ju I just couldn't cope with it, but I didn't have Nahum in my head at the time. <laughs> so I was sort of on the back foot um, thinking, oh yeah, it looks as though, you know, God's um, judgment is not being carried out, yes. uh, but use... I was wrong to lose my call because it ruined no, the Sunday lunch. But it's, but it's driven by but... passion. You, yeah. you know, yes. that, it's, it's driven by this passion, knowing that it's. it's because for true. me, if you can, if you can gerrymander God's word and yes. fit it to your yeah. age, as it were, no, why? Do, why the spirit will always the spirit and the word will always agree with yes, God's word. Exactly. So if you think you're getting revelation that. Yes. Yeah contradicts the word of God, yeah. it's not from the Holy Spirit. No, it's so, sure. it, absolutely yeah. right. So they'll, they'll use Jonah, just the way you said, and then they'll use the discussion of Abraham with the Lord on the way to... Yes, uh, on Sodom. On the way to Sodom yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, so yeah. they use these two arguments here that God can be persuaded to change his mind without understanding the sovereignty of God at all. Yeah. Okay. Um, have, uh, I think we also need to talk about Nineveh the town, let's call it, as well. But is this the time to talk about it? Setting well, the if scene. we keep going, keep we going can through just the finish list, off on the, the just quickly. We, so we got Tiglath, right? And he goes from until 727. And then he's taken over for a short time by Shalmaneser, mm. uh, who in 722, Sargon takes over. Now he's also in the Bible, as is Shalmaneser. And Sargon is the one in 720 that destroys the northern kingdom of Israel. Mm. So he's used as an instrument of mm. 
judgment really on, on Israel because of her idolatry. And um, he continues to 705, and then we have Sennacherib, yeah. all right, who, who actually is a type of the Antichrist, I believe. Um, we might get into that, but um, he, Sennacherib was the one that almost destroyed Judah as well, and, and this was very dangerous. And this is when Hezekiah, actually only Jerusalem stood, and Hezekiah was in faith, calling on the Lord, and that's when the angel of the Lord comes and kills 180,000, 185,000. And it's a bit of a picture of Armageddon mm. Um, mm. Uh, with the Assyrian, mm. and, and, but, but Israel in faith, calling on the Lord, and the Lord returns, the angel of the Lord destroys those Assyrian armies. So, so that he's a picture of the Antichrist. So these Assyrian kings are, are kind of Antichrist in nature. Mm. Mm. So, so we know that on the Sennacherib's prism or Taylor's prism, you have I, I caged Hezekiah like a bird. Was yeah. that was that the height of the was that a turning point in in the, the you know the ascent of power of the Assyrians or were they still going up? Not exactly. Well, obviously, in terms of Sennacherib, that that definitely took the, you know, because he admitted he couldn't take Jerusalem. Yeah. He obviously doesn't, they never, they always spin it as best they can in yeah. their favour. Didn't say my army was destroyed, but he admits he could, didn't take Jerusalem. And he had to go home and then he was assassinated by his sons. Yeah. So as far as Sennacherib was concerned, but no, the Assyrian Empire continued to be very strong. He was replaced by his son Ezahaddon, mm. who it was in the, mentioned in the Bible too. Mm who uh, was a very uh, um, strong king again, and that's the time of Manasseh. Mm -hmm. And then we come to the, the main one we want to talk about is Ashurbanipal. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was in uh, 669 to 631. And he six, was six, the... Nine. So he passed this... through the year 666. Right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Sorry, <carry> on. <laughs> and, and he was considered, in a sense, the greatest king yeah. of Assyria. That's when the Assyrian Empire on, on, you know, reached its greatest extent. Mm -hmm. So in his glory days, the Assyrian Empire was strongest under Ashurbanipal. And, and he did this great library in Nineveh. Mm -hmm. And uh, he built on, Sennacherib made Nineveh the, his capital, mm -hmm. and Ashurbanipal built on that. So he was, you know, the strongest king ever. Yeah. And it's in his reign Nahum's that Nahum writings. prophesied uh, at the very height of the Assyrian Empire. So when Nahum describes not just Nineveh having a setback, but its utter destruction, mm. um, people would have thought, you know, this is, this is impossible. That, and yet yeah. it came to pass. In fact, just to set the date, if we go to um, Nahum 3.8, okay. um, just quickly, this is uh, the key verse. Are you giving for that? John plenty of time to That's prepare what? for his next? <laughs> no, Sorry, no, 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 it's good. <laughs> Three, well, chapter eight. I'm listening to Derek. This is just to Three set the time, eight. just to prove that it it was at Nineveh's height. Yeah. You know, because it wouldn't be very impressive if he actually prophesied it when Nineveh was in kind of terminal decline. Yeah. You know what I mean? But actually, it says, "Are you better, Nahum 3a? Are you better than No Ammon?" Mm -hmm. Now, this is the city of Nam Ammon. Mm -hmm. which was situated by the river. That's actually the Nile River. Yeah. Yeah. And then it goes on. I won't read the, the whole mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. But it basically says, this is Thebes yeah. in Egypt. This is like the main city in Egypt. And it was like Nineveh, surrounded by water, had a lot of kind of w water defences, and it seemed to be impregnable. And he says, you know, it's, there's lots of allied nations all around protecting it. And yet, in 663, Ashurbanipal, this is the height of his success. Mm. He actually invaded Egypt mm. and, he, and he destroyed Thebes yeah. and he was merciless. Yeah, so that's 663. Six, six, so three. that is um, in living memory. And Nahum is using that. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Nahum's using that as a recent example. You think you're safe. Yeah. Thebes yeah. thought it was safe. It was the mighty city. And yet look at it now. Yeah. Okay, and John, let's talk about Thebes. <laughs> Just I can't briefly. talk. I'm not. Oh, you can't. No, no, <laughs> okay, no. no. Okay. No, I, I um, can't talk about Thebes. It's, I, I've Over been down you, into that part of the world, oh, well, down have. the That's Nile. Good. Yes, right. Of where Luxor is, is, you know. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's like the Valley yeah. of the Kings. Yeah. 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 When I went to the Valley of Kings, it, yeah. was, it was empty. I was there. Mm. With a, not yeah. surprisingly. They're no, all there was dead. Nobody, nobody there in there. It wasn't yet a tourist spot. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Well, that is a long time. Yeah, Was that in the army? 
I was in the army. In the army. Yes, I, I went with a couple of chaps. We yep, my dad was in the army. Th thumbed a lift across just... across the Nile from um, Luxor, where we were staying, and wow. uh, there was a chap with a taxi ready to take us to the Valley of Kings. So you, you lived out he, Lawrence he of Arabia. A bare wire which is <laughs> stuck underneath the dashboard and the, and the, and the taxi sprung into life. Yeah, That's we were amazing. the only people there. Yeah. Nobody, so nobody else. They were the days. Before the big tankers, super tankers, went yeah. down the Suez Canal. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another story. Let's not get onto that. <laughs> so, so, John, give us your, your take on this, especially that, that period of time. Um, and, or let, not that period of time, because you're very good at bringing it up to more recent times. Well, uh, yeah, th this, is how, this is how I see it. And, and I have to say, not only me, I'm not taking, mm. you know, m making a claim for this at all. But, but the, 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 f the fact that we, and we have to take, I say to all our, list, all our viewers and mm. listeners, you must take Jonah and Nahum together, mm. because that's the only way you can make sense of the history and what is going on. You'll miss it if you, if you only take the, take the one. Mm. But this, I believe, uh, partly illustrated or demonstrated rather by the discovery of these two fragments this year, mm. and is, is right up to date. This, as I say, is both a historical book and it's, it was prophetic in its time, but it, it's prophetic for us. It's historical and prophetic of the times we're in and entering into. I don't know mm. how much the viewers know about what's going on in the world and how much what is called the cabal. I mean, that's how, how much they run everything. The, everything, the banking system, the pharmaceutical industry, the, the NGOs, they are in complete control. And to be, I'm not saying individuals oper working those things are wicked, but I'm saying the institutions are wicked and they're run by wicked people. And this is exactly what was happening here. Mm -hmm. And we see that God brought well, them an down. Incredible and he, breed. he will bring yeah. these people down. He will bring the new world order down, crumbling down, mm -hmm. just like he's did to here. Mm -hmm. So this is, as I say, not, uh, uh, Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire was the type. The new world order and the wicked that they get up to is the mm. anti-type. And mm. we are in those yeah, times. It's I mean, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun at all. Should no. we try and go it's through? It's interesting yep. that um, the Assyrian kings, like Ashurbanipal, they believe that from their god, they were given the right to rule the world. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, they were the rightful world rulers. Mm. Um, and if anyone resisted their rule, they weren't just rebelling against them, they were rebelling against their God, and therefore they had the right to crush yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. And in a sense, That's I exactly think you could say it does breed an analogy tyranny. how these people see it. <laughs> it does breed tyranny. It's yeah. like, um, you know, Henry VIII, you know, it's the divine yes, rule it does. Uh, of kings. You, you are the divine emissary. This is the Caesarian Mafia yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah. And these are the people that Jesus talks about, people who call themselves Jews but are not. Yeah. They're not and never were. But they're masquerading as Jews, mm. um, and that serves their purpose too, because it yeah. feeds anti-Semitism, which is all part of their wicked purpose. Mm. But that's that's an, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. another matter. So, so for me, there are echoes of, um, you know, Belshazzar's feast. Yes. You know, it's like yeah. you know, at your you are weighed in the balance and found yes. wanting. Yes. It's, there are also echoes of the last Shah of Iran. Yes, because he was at his height in terms of wealth. He, he held, there's a great book by William Shawcross called The Shah's Last Ride. And in, in the year before he was deposed, he crowned himself King of Kings mm. and Lord of Lords in a grand ceremony mm. to mark the 3,000th anniversary, I think, of Persepolis. And he had all the world's glitterati. In other words, all of the, the one world power people were all there in this wonderful yes. um, $300 million party. Mm. And he... Um, uh, and he was deposed within nine months. Yes, and he was already dying Ayatollah. of cancer. He probably yeah. didn't know it. The Ayatollah, yeah. bang. Yeah. Yeah. And we're still living in the consequence of that. Yes. So there are echoes through history. Yeah. Are we going to get to a verse by verse well, on, on this? But just to fix the date, because yes. I haven't oh, quite yes, done please. that yeah. yet. Absolutely. Um, so Thebes fell in 663, and then, but also Thebes began... What happened at that point is that um, Ashurbanipal was... Um, distracted by problems elsewhere. And so Thebes began to be restored, actually about uh, 654. So for, for those 
that verse on Thebes to, to be, you know, valid, mm. it, we have to date it at around 655. Mm. Okay. okay, so that means that the fall of Nineveh took place in 612, so that's about 40 years after Nahum. Nahum prophesied, well, it was at its literal peak. Mm. And, but only 40 years later, it was totally destroyed. And you can just track what happened. Soon after that prophecy was given, it started going into decline. Mm. Because, for instance, um, Elam rebelled in 653. Mm. Now, they were, he was successfully put down. But then in 652, his brother, who was in charge of Babylon, Ashurbanipal's brother, rebelled. Again, you know, it was two or three years, and they, he successfully put down that rebellion, but it was taking a lot out of him, having to deal with these rebellions. Egypt, which he had conquered now, he couldn't hold on to. Um, then in 645, the Medes arise as an independent kingdom, and they become one of the, the enemies. Of so if you can see, it's almost like it, yeah. the cracks are beginning to appear. It's almost immediately after Nahum gives this prophecy, all these adversaries start rising up and feel they can, they've got a chance. And, and then uh, what we find in 636, Ash Ashurbanipal's records cease to exist. The last five years, maybe he became ill. So the Assyrian Empire is going, and as soon as he dies as well, we discover, it, it, again, it's decline. And in the Bible it's good story... It's isn't it, John, just listening? Because we're getting uh, the detail and the sequence, and which is, I think folks will really appreciate. And it's interesting, you'll see that in the reign of Manasseh, the Assyrians are very dominant. Mm. But in the reign of Josiah, 640, mm. there's no sign of the Assyrians. Josiah can do his reforms, not just in Judah, but up north in Israel too, in that area. And there's no hint of an Assyrian presence because Assyria is losing its power. Mm. And, and then Ashurbanipal falls sick. And then when he hands power over, it goes into rapid decline. And then finally, the, the Medo-Babylonian Empire ri rises up after his death in 626. Mm. And this is Nabopalatza, and this w is the next big empire that's coming along. The, but it began in 626. Babylon rebelled, and Assyria couldn't stop it. And eventually, it's Babylon and the Medes mm. that are going to destroy Nineveh in 612. Mm. So it's awesome to see how it, it is. panned out. Yeah. The prophecy in 655, and immediately now, it, mm. The process is begun of like unraveling this empire, and 40 years later, there's yeah, but it's no, nothing left. But it's interesting, it's 40. That number 40 is it's hugely interesting. significant. It's interesting. Isn't it? yeah. I also find it interesting that, that the prophecy of Daniel hasn't even begun. It reminds yeah. me of Churchill when he said, This isn't the end, you know, it isn't the end, the beginning of the end, it's perhaps the end of the beginning. And so we haven't even got to. The statue of Nebuchadnezzar, you know, with yeah. with the Babylonian, you know, Medo yeah. Persian, uh, Greek, and, and Romans, you know, it's all it's it's, a, it's setting the mm. stage yes. for, for for what is, yeah. you know, I, I know you, you you've said already Sennacherib being a type of the Antichrist, but it's setting the stage for these end times prophecies, mm. yeah. you know, which are all sort of encapsulated in Daniel. The other thing that that sort of comes to mind is that Thebes, you know, it was in living memory um, that that. Mm. Thebes have fallen. When the Lord was asked about what will be the signs of your coming, he said, learn from the prophet Daniel, you know, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, you know that time is near. He, that was something, you know, it was a slightly longer uh, in the past, you know, distant mm. memory, but it was still in living memory, as it were. It was yeah. sort of grandparents with the, the Maccabee, you know, um, revolts uh, you know, against Antiochus mm. Epiphanes. Mm. So the Lord was saying, yeah. you know, when you see this, it's a sign. It's the Lord does mm. help us, doesn't he? By mm. you know, when, and he probably helped the people of of Nineveh or, or um, us uh, or the or the the Hebrews to to. It was still there in the conscious. Mm. The, mm. The, so the Lord's not unfair, as it were. He gives us some illustration mm. of something that's in the memory the collective yes. memory of what's happened. Yes. He didn't say, oh, you know, the, the Thebes was a real thing happened. Yes, it wasn't just some, some sort of um, imaginary thing. Mm. It was something real that they could identify with. Exactly, and he's saying the same thing's going to happen to you. Yeah. yeah. And Nahum, I understand, was, must have been held in quite high esteem, even though they probably didn't like what he said, because he's buried about 60 miles north of, 
of Nineveh. That is a good and, and um, I, I, of course, ISIL destroyed a lot in, in recent yeah. history, but he had quite a tomb. I mean, it's quite Did they take it out, the tomb? Well, they, I know there was a big restoration, wasn't there? There, was a, there has been a restoration. No, they, they smashed this. I don't know the detail of it. But it's a fair took, point yeah. that they revered in that part of the world. Mm. Um, yeah. they, the, the prophet. Yeah. yeah. And I've got, got to get my head around this now. So Nahum was a Hebrew prophet, yeah. but it lived yes. in that part of the world. Well, it, it is argued. I'm just, you know, just testing no, no, the waters. Nobody here. knows for sure. I mean, one theory that I used to think, because um, the Kepa Nahum, okay. the village yes. of Nahum, yes, of course. that he was a prophet that may have lived yeah. in Galilee. In the northern others think Galilee. he was in uh, Judah. And others think that, well, because he was buried there, yeah. Um, that, and, and the Arabs certainly believe that, um, that perhaps he, he was exiled, he was part of the exiled Israelites, of and he actually lived near there, and, of and he, yes, that, that would have been, meant he was much braver <laughs> in giving his Even prophecy. Even more so, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, because we, 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 you know, we only know what we're given, but <clears throat> this man had a life and, and a family, and, and we'd, he might have lived there amongst these people, been talking to them, and, but like yeah. Jonah did, only more gently for years, yeah. and, and, and greatly revered as a, as a wise man, you yeah. know, and, and, and then he delivers this prophecy, yes. and then it comes true. Mm -hmm. So he's revered yeah. and, 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 um, yeah. and, and given a, a, a significant to. I, I think it's interesting it, what you said about the 40 years, yeah. because it is actually 40 years if you, because you see, the, yeah, part of the background is that that the son of Ezahadam, the older son, was, uh, I hate these names. <laughs> I love them. Uh, Shash Shu Ukin. Yeah, that's Shashu really Ukin that's it, Shashu. was the older brother. He should have been the king, but for some reason, the Ezahadam want, wanted Ashurbanipal to be the king. So the brother was given control of Babylon, which was under Assyrian control. But basically he resented being, you know, number two. Yeah. And Ashurbanipal controlled everything. So he was more of a pup bit of a puppet. And, and so eventually this brother um, rose up. And in a sense, you could really tr track the downfall from this moment when Babylon rebelled. Mm. And it took three years to put that down. And that, if, if you're going to mark a point in which it, things began to go downhill for Ashurbanipal, mm. um, he had to expend a huge amount of effort to, to deal with that. That was in 652. Yeah. So 40 years exactly is yeah. 612, which is the, mm. the fall of Nineveh. You yeah. see, the and that Lord, happened shortly after Nahum. The Lord, the author of all history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens by chance. Yeah. No generations or entitled are skipped by chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's history and, planned in advance. And, and how, how sort of Western civilization has, has sort of formed around these, these different moves of empire and, you know, and tyranny, and it's sort of yeah. eventually reaches the, the Romans and, yeah, as it were. And it, it is, <laughs> we learn a, an enormous amount, don't we, mm. studying. Uh, but, but many of us, to, be, to our shame, we don't study it. We don't look into it in detail. And yet there's so much that we can learn yes. from it. Um, OK, I and really these, enjoyed these, these overviews. So I, could do, I could do four weeks of overviews, Well, you by could, the way. you could indeed. And I know there are some people, and I understand the point of view, that think we should be concentrating just on the New Testament. But, <laughs> but, 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 not, I, not in this sense. No, but I know there are some who feel that. Mm. But the point is, Scripture tells us that all these things are mm. written for our admonition. Yes. They mm. are really important. And if we have a tender heart, the Lord would teach us all sorts. Through well, there, there, there is so much that from the New Testament that comes to mind. Yes, I know. So for me, I mean, in Peter, 2 Peter 3, it says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Yeah. Um, it, he doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the New Testament is there sort of illustrated through all of these scriptures because people could think that he is... You know, oh, the, the warning about Nineveh, people think, oh, well, it's, you know, everything earlier on in chapter 3 of 2 Peter, is, you know, everything just carries on as it always has. And so, mm. so you can become desensitized by your wealth and prosperity, mm. and it applies in a, someone's life as well. But the Lord is not slow in keeping no. his promises. He yes. will fulfill his word. And the other warning, as you were pointing out, is that but when judgment does come, that's it. It's final. It's it. That's and, and really so scary. You dare not play games with yes. God because 
you don't know when his patience is going to yeah. run out. Yeah. And when it does, then, then that's it. And it's very clear that the fall of Assyria, it was almost immediately Assyria got wiped out of history. I mean, that, there, there wasn't even a, a, a remembrance of Assyria. Mm. It just mm. disappeared, disappears from history. Mm. And it was such a final judgment. Mm. And so we need to learn that. that mm. uh, I have a close friend, I'll, I'll, share, I'll share it now and I won't mention names, but for me, I, I read this and I think that um, this, this, this friend has basically known the repentance of the Ninevites in his own life. He has then forgotten God's mercy and, and he has taken it for granted mm. and now he's gone away from the Lord. Yeah. And it's almost as though he is in absolute danger of mm. the judgment hammer falling. Yes. Mm. And, uh, and when people go away from the Lord, it's the most tragic thing. When they've known yeah. the Lord, they've, they've tasted the heavenly gift, as it were. Yeah. Is there a way back? That's Hebrew 6. We, we may talk about that. Is there a way back? God knows it's the tragic, heart. You know. it's, it's a tragic thing the, he does. Yeah. Lord, have mercy, have mm. mercy. Yeah, so, you know, again, Romans, so as you're talking about the New Testament, I mean, Romans 11, yes. God's mercy shown to them. Yes. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Mm. Yeah. He will show, you know, he, he can show kindness well, to we those see, who we have rebelled um, and, and to you, but consider the branches that were broken off. Yeah. Mm. There's some warnings there. There are Even warnings. though I really come from a Calvinist camp, I, yeah. I, I recognise the warnings of Scripture. Yeah, yes. very, very much so. And, and, and we, we see it here, the Lord talking to his people. Um, and he, he, he's, he says, um, in verse 12 of chapter 1, I mean, yep. we'll come to it, yep. the last part of it. This is sort he, of nominally our chapter 1 yeah. um, study, by the way. We've and got this, about 10 you, minutes. You have to have your wits about you when you're yeah. reading this because most of it is addressed to Nineveh, but occasionally he's talking to Israel. Yeah. And here in, in the, the, he, here in chapter 12, he's talking to Israel. Though they're safe and likewise many yet, in this manner they will be cut down. That's talking, that's talking about mm. uh, Syria. And then he says, though I've afflicted you, Israel, Mm. I will afflict you no more. Mm. So that judgment has come upon them. It didn't mean that they were, you know, Daniel went into captivity, but Daniel was saved. Mm. Of course, Daniel acted and behaved as if he was saved. But, you know, in the case of your friend, mm. if he ever belonged to the God, mm. he, uh, mm. and, you know, I'm a Calvinist through God and through, yeah. he, he is always God's, yeah. but he may well come under judgment in the yeah. meantime. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it might be very unpleasant. Mm. Mm. Verse 12, by the way, is a key verse because this proves that this is not given during the decline of the Assyrian Empire because it, it says the As Nineveh is safe. Yes. You know, it's yeah. very secure yeah. and many. You know, yes. This is the biggest empire that has ever been in history mm. at this point. So mm. this establishes that it was given at the height of the empire. Mm. New Testament again, you know, you're, you've, you've got your full barns tonight, your soul is required. Right, you? yes. Yeah. You, you, when you think you've got everything and then bang, yeah. you, you, if your heart isn't right before the Lord, you're in trouble. It's in Romans 11, it does yeah. talk, consider the 22, yes. therefore consider the goodness and severity, yes. which yes. literally means the cutting off of God. Yes. yes. On those you who fell severity, but on, toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will also be cut off. So yes. one can interpret it in different ways. Is it eternal judgment? Is it temporal judgment? Mm. But it's very clear, he says, you also will be cut off. Yeah. If you don't take this warning, Which is this there will verse. be a cutting yeah. off of some yes. sort. Exactly. And, and it's very clear, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, very. Um, okay, so we've got five minutes remaining. We'll probably well, do well, verse one if you want. Yeah, should we, should we see if we can <laughs> um, crack, or, and two maybe. Um, so, uh, verse 1, I, I'm, I'm intrigued to know what you'll bring out of verse 1. Well, it's an indirect. It says the burden. I think, uh, That's right. I, I think it's, I think perhaps we all, intercessors are aware of having a burden. Yes, or, very much so. Um, when you have a message to give, mm. it, it's like a burden on you. And you know that when you've given that message, there, there's a release. Mm. It's like you've discharged that burden. Yeah, so, it's an interesting word that's used for 
the prophet particularly, he has a burden to deliver. And, and it's like Jeremiah talked to, you know, he w didn't want to have to carry this thing, but, exactly. you know, it's like having a baby and you've got to, yeah. you've got to bring it to birth. There's no escape from it, mm. you know. The word, he says, is shut up within me and wants mm. to burst out. Yeah. So that's his experience. It's like, in this case, a burden of judgment that ha he has to release. Mm. And, and again, it says the vision. So he received a lot of this in vision form. He, he literally saw the end of Nineveh. He mm. saw it with his eyes. And, and I think perhaps that's a sign that maybe he did live in the area there. Yes. And that he, as he looked at Nineveh, God opened his eyes and he, he saw this collapse of Nineveh taking place before mm. his eyes. Mm. And what, what uh, a blessing though for yeah. For Nahum, yes, who have been faithful, conveyed the message, mm. and you think you've mentioned all those potentates, none of whom anyone's heard of, but this is an enduring prophecy. Yes, that up to our day we have this um, of of dear uh, the dear servant of God mm. uh, of Nahum. Um, but it is the the word here tr translated burden in some versions. It says the oracle, yes. and oracles are are you know very often talking of judgment. Mm. Yes. Um, but it's both an oracle, a burden, and a vision. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's but a hard thing in our day now. So there, there are some strong words that need to be spoken, the truth spoken in love in our um, day and generation. And I, I, I think we all feel burdened yes. to speak God's word into today's world. Yes. Um, but it's, you know, it's a similar situation. They do not want to hear. They don't, and the consequence, as we in see, in fact, you mentioned the word Christian. You're a hate. You're, yes. you're a hate preacher. Yes. Just, yes. just almost got to that now. Yes, they sh you're shut down. Yes, I think I think almost more so in Britain than in America. There's yeah, some very much America so. has some really feisty culture wars, mm. but they still say, oh well, it's still Voltairean. You can still say it. Yeah. <laughs> you can still insult me. Whereas Britain, I think, is you know, with the woke culture, you 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 just go anywhere near. Um, talking about the Christian gospel, and that's the end of the debate. You know, yes. sorry, you've, you know, yes. you're gagged. Just proportionally, there are more Christians in America. Yeah, still. Yeah, yeah. And, I, just, uh, I also think that there's a more of a democratic openness. There's something yeah, about yeah. what the, dare I say, cancel culture, which is basically shut down anything that has any hint of, of, um, mm. you know, all the all the all the historic things, but. But the Lord knows, you know, yeah. and, and, and he, he addresses this in, 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 in verse 2. Can we go to verse 2? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where, where We've got all of three it minutes. Says, <laughs> God is jealous, you know. That, you, I know you want to talk about it, this, Derek, this word jealous, but, you know, he's, he's f fervent, passionate about mm. his people. Yeah. In this case, the Israelites and, yeah. and, and, and us. He's fervent about it. And, and he knows exactly what's going on. He's not indifferent or blind to it. Mm. And what are the consequences? This is very interesting, in, as it were, um, idiomatic biblical custom, because we've got the, the, the threefold reference here to vengeance. Mm. You know, holy, holy, holy is mm. the Lord. Mm. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Mm. When it's mentioned three times, you need to stick up. I mean, that's mm. how the Lord emphasizes mm. this is important. Mm. And, and so he said, the Lord avenges, mm. the, 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 and the Lord avenges, the Lord avenges and is yeah. furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. So they'll get away with shutting us down for so long, but my goodness me, yeah. that give, gives you an indication of how powerful and how absolute this vengeance yeah. is going to yeah. be and how righteous yeah thank you vengeance very much John. Lord. that's a good that's it's a good end of the beginning uh, and you know of course in verse 3 he will not at all acquit the wicked yeah. so so you you will get it consistently from bible study we will seek to be faithful to what the lord is saying in his word and not try and be mealy mouth to fit in with the modern world mm. so Bless you for watching. We look forward to seeing you next week as we continue in the study of Nahum.